Today, I'll be talking about my five cardinal rules of EKG interpretation. This video will assume you already have some basic knowledge of EKGs, like what different waveforms are and how to determine the intervals and the axis. If you know nothing about EKGs, you may want to check out some of my other videos first and come back to this one later. So let's start. Rule number one, never trust the computer. Most modern EKG machines actually have computer algorithms that attempt to diagnose various electrocardiographic abnormalities. While I appreciate that programmers have done their best to accomplish this very difficult task, the algorithm is just not reliable enough to trust people's lives on. Consider this EKG for a moment. This was taken of a patient who showed up to a pre-op clinic prior to an elective orthopedic procedure. He was seen by an anesthesia resident who took a look at the EKG and copied this diagnosis of sinus bradycardia with first degree AV block into the chart before clearing the patient for surgery in a few days. After all, asymptomatic sinus bradycardia and first degree AV block are rarely causes for concern. Luckily, however, when the patient showed up on the day of surgery, still feeling fine, an anesthesia attending double checked the EKG before proceeding with the case and she noticed a funny extra waveform attached to the back of the T wave right here. And she further noticed that the funny extra waveform didn't just happen once, but again and again in a very consistent pattern. She immediately concluded the computer's diagnosis was wrong and in fact the patient actually had sinus rhythm with two to one second degree AV block. While this is not necessarily an emergency, provided that the patient is asymptomatic, mentating normally, and has a normal blood pressure, it is a reason to cancel an elective surgery and investigate the heart further first. While this type of error is not particularly common, it's also not particularly rare. During times when I'm covering the inpatient medicine service at the Palo Alto VA, I probably come across similar mistakes by the computer algorithm at least once a week. So again, the computer usually gets it right, but usually is not good enough. There are two exceptions to this rule. First, the computer calculated heart rate is correct more than 99.9% .9 of the time. The only time I've ever seen it inaccurate is when there is so much artifact that the EKG is completely uninterpretable and should not have even been recorded, or when the T waves are so prominent that the computer mistakes them for QRS complexes and thus reports a heart rate twice what it actually is. The second exception is that if the computer's overall impression is quote normal EKG, then the EKG is highly likely to be normal. The converse of this, however, is definitely not true. That is, there are plenty of normal EKGs that get interpreted as abnormal by the computer. Particularly common errors of this type are for the computer to state a patient has a junctional rhythm when it's really sinus with unusually small P waves, or it comments on the presence of ST or T wave abnormalities, which are actually within the range of normal. Next, rule number two, always examine the EKG systematically. I have another video talking about my preferred systematic method in more detail, but here's a brief overview using this EKG as an example. Step one in the systematic method is to identify the rhythm. There are five parts to this. Part A is the rhythm fast, slow, or normal. In this example, it's about 60 beats per minute. Part B, is it regular or irregular? Here, it's regular. Is it narrow or wide, meaning a narrow or wide QRS complex? In other words, is the duration of the QRS interval within normal, or is it long? This one is narrow complex. Then, what is the atrial activity? More specifically, are there P waves? If so, what is their morphology? And if not, are there fibrillation or flutter waves? In this EKG, P waves are normal. The final rhythm question is what is the relationship between the atrial and ventricular activity, which will require examination of the PR interval, which is normal here, and the recognition that there is a one-to-one -one relationship between P waves and QRS complexes in which each P becomes immediately prior to the corresponding QRS. From those five steps, we should know the rhythm, which is normal sinus.
The next step in this systematic method is examination of the QRS axis and morphology. The axis is about positive 60 here and the morphology is normal. The final step is examination of the ST segment and T wave morphology, which also includes assessment of the QT interval. All of those are normal. So if one were not to just summarize these findings, but also synthesize them into a unified impression of the EKG, one would say that it was a normal study. This leads directly into the third rule. When one synthesizes the individual findings into an impression, one must consider the clinical context. Why don't we go through this non-normal EKG to demonstrate another example of synthesizing an impression from individual findings? Consider pausing the video here to practice the step on your own first. I won't go through every step individually, but just to highlight the major findings. The rate is about 105 beats per minute. The QRS interval is 110 milliseconds, or uh, 2 and 3 fourths small boxes, which counts as narrow complex. If we examine the end of the V1 rhythm strip, we see clear P waves preceding each QRS complex. There is a one-to-one -one relationship between them. The P waves are normal, and the PR interval is about 140 milliseconds. What's the QRS axis? The polarity of the QRS is down in lead 1 and up in lead AVF, which means the patient has a right axis deviation. There are tall R waves in V1 and V2, and deep S waves in 1 and AVL. So how would one synthesize all of these findings into a unified impression? The impression might be a mild sinus tachycardia of unknown etiology and probable right ventricular hypertrophy. Unfortunately, what have I forgotten to do? I forgot to consider the clinical context. So what if that patient is not a middle-aged person with dyspnea and lower extremity edema, as you might assume, but rather a healthy one-day-old neonate? What should our impression be then? Well, first, infants tend to have QRS axes rightward to positive 90 degrees and tall R waves in V1 and V2 on account of a higher pulmonary artery pressure while in the womb. They also have faster heart rates and more narrow QRS complexes. So instead of concluding that the EKG shows evidence of RVH, which would imply suspected pathology, an appropriate impression of this EKG might be that there is unexplained relative QRS prolongation and it is otherwise normal. And if anything, the resting heart rate of 105 for a one day old is a bit slower than average. So the bottom line, consideration of clinical context is necessary to create an accurate impression. Now back to the rules. Rule number four, compare the current EKG to the patient's previous EKGs if they are available. There are plenty of circumstances in which this is important, but it is most critical in evaluating suspected ischemia and or infarction. For example, suppose a patient presents to the ER with chest pain. Per US standard of care, an EKG gets completed within five minutes. If that EKG shows a left bundle branch block, the next question to ask is, is that left bundle branch block present on a recent prior EKG? If the answer is no, the left bundle is assumed to be the consequence of acute ischemia and or infarction. Therefore, these patients proceed immediately to the cath lab and are considered to be a subtype of ST elevation MI unless cath proves them to be otherwise. If, however, a left bundle branch block was present on a prior EKG, the patient remains in the ER for the standard chest pain evaluation, which will usually consist of an admission to the medical service to have serial EKGs and cardiac enzymes checked with or without an evaluation of alternative diagnoses such as pulmonary embolism. Finally, my last cardinal rule is to incorporate the EKG impression into the generation of the differential diagnosis. So what exactly do I mean by that? Shouldn't that already be obvious? Well, consider that the EKG is the functional gold standard for only some diagnoses. These include most arrhythmias and bundle branch blocks. However, the EKG is only another piece of imperfect data for other diagnoses. Chamber enlargement, myocardial ischemia and infarction, and electrolyte abnormalities are all associated with specific EKG changes, 
but you would never diagnose any of these conditions based solely on an EKG. Even anatomically localized ST elevations, classic for an ST elevation MI, have a differential diagnosis that includes more than the MI, for example, a left ventricular aneurysm and Takotsubo cardiomyopathy. Even when the EKG shows a finding that is certain and unambiguous, such as atrial fibrillation, it still isn't usually a final diagnosis, as the clinician next needs to ask what other condition led to those cardiac abnormalities. For example, there is usually some explanation for AFib, such as chronic hypertension or acute heart failure or drug intoxication. EKG abnormalities don't develop in isolation. They always require some explanation. So those are my five cardinal rules of EKG interpretation. Never trust the computer. Always examine the EKG systematically. Synthesize individual findings into an impression with consideration of the clinical context. Compare the current EKG to prior if possible. And finally, incorporate the EKG impression into the generation of the patient's differential diagnosis, remembering that the EKG is just another piece of data. If you found this video to be helpful, I hope you'll consider subscribing and checking out my other videos on EKG interpretation.